So I'm going to talk about the perspective. So I create the problems which I didn't have to deal with myself. Uh, I can't really refer them on to somebody else and uh, get blamed for it. So as I'm sure we'll all agree, the majority of the patients, a uh, uh, majority of the younger patients who come for hip replacement, they start the pathology in younger years as, as children. Uh, and, and three of the examples which I chose today has been mentioned before. So Perthes disease is, is a common precursor uh, of uh, end-state osteoarthritis. Uh, hip dysplasia, we, we talked about. Uh, and uh, slipped upper femoral epiphysis. And may I say many more as well, you know, uh, like avascular necrosis, uh, like sickle cell, which we have a fair number of in, in this, uh, this part of the world. Uh, but the problem also is that some of these patients would have had attempted hip preservation, uh, and that would have created a unique set of problems. So, so in these patients, it's not that we do not know there's a problem in the anatomy. We always know, but the question is what to do with them. Hip preservation surgery really aims at maintaining or preserving the hyaline cartilage so that the hip can function as well as it could for as long as it is, po it is possible. In practice, though, it usually means that we change the anatomy of the hip joint to, to try and preserve the hyaline cartilage. Uh, and we do succeed in, in a lot of the cases uh, by changing the soft tissue, by doing the soft tissue procedures, open reductions, muscle lengthening, and acetabular labral surgery, or doing pelvic and femoral and sometimes both osteotomies. We are aiming to delay. We can't we can't claim that we can prevent hip replacement. Well, to my knowledge, I don't think it's possible to claim that we can prevent hip replacement, but we certainly try and delay it as long as possible, hoping that when we do do the hip replacement, it is the only procedure they require uh, in their life lifetime. This is one case which is one of my own. So he's 15 years of age. A year before being referred to me, he had uh, uh, a slipped upper femoral epiphysis. Uh, please ignore the broken drill bit. But you will, I'm sure, all agree that there is an issue with the offset, and he has a large impingement lesion. Uh, in my wisdom, I thought if I do a volgus osteotomy, I'll be able to move that uh, impingement lesion away. Obviously, it didn't work. He, he is six foot two, plays rugby, and he still had pain. So he then required uh, an open head and neck debridement, surgical dislocation, trochanteric transfer, and labral repair. So I put to you now is that this patient now has a multiplanar deformity. He has an intramedullary callus, a broken drill bit, uh, and a trochanteric deformity. So when he comes to have a hip replacement, I'm sure you'll agree that uh, it won't be a straightforward hip replacement. Another one is this patient who's 33, 30 years old, female. She was expecting, uh, well, she was hoping to have a, a baby and decided to have pelvic surgery before that. So she had this triple osteotomy which obviously has created a, a large deformity of the femoral head. There is an overcoverage of the femoral head. Uh, somebody's, well, we, we've tried to address to the labrum, uh, but, uh, but she remains symptomatic and would be coming for hip replacement. This younger patient who plays for uh, 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 an academy team uh, at the first presentation was considered to be uh, a, a Perthes disease, when actually it was a dysplasia. So, uh, she required pelvic and femoral osteotomy and now has got femoral canal malalignment, varus neck, uh, and would be a challenge. Uh, and the last case, which I'm going to share with you before we go on to the, the topic under discussion today, is the resolved Perthes disease. So this patient is 13 now and has got what we call hinged abduction. So when uh, she abducts, it's just opening up the medial side. So we've obviously done, in my opinion, a good valgus osteotomy. We've given ourselves a good femoral head, which would articulate well in a few years before it comes to total hip replacement. But now the patient has got a two-plane deformity, which is an abduction and flexion deformity. And if she were to go for a preformous entry point, there is a very high chance that there'll be a perforation. If you look at, our, uh, at the outcome of these patients, we know that hip dysplasia patients, about two-thirds of them, would require a total hip replacement within 30 years of presenting for hip dysplasia, which usually means in their 40s. If they did not have any treatment, they would have required hip replacement in their 20s and 30s. Perthes disease, we know about 17% would last about 40 years. 
they tend to do better than either of the other two groups. We think it's probably because the femoral had remodels to some extent, uh, but uh, but majority of the time they just put up with it. They're, they are a young, burly man, and they just continue to persevere as long as they can. Slipped upper femoral epiphysis does not do very well, though. Within 16 years, half of them would require total hip replacement, which usually means in their 30s. So, so we need to be aware that uh, these are the patients, although we're doing what we call hip preservation, we're only delaying it for a few, few years before they need a hip replacement. But why does it matter? We know that if, we, if these patients come in for total hip replacement, they would have a difficult exposure because of, because of multiple scars. There's a risk of perforation or femoral fractures. Implant position is usually less than ideal, as we've been talking about earlier today. The implant fixation can be compromised because the, the medullary canal is not usually as anatomical as it should have been. The hip can be unstable, and they have abnormal biomechanics. So as hip replacement surgeons, I suppose we need to address to all these issues and hopefully have a better outcome. Uh, there has been evidence from published literature that hip replacement after any femoral osteotomy gives a compromised outcome. Uh, I think the slide is not going to show up very well, but what it, was, it shows is that the risk of complications, which are generic complications, is higher in patients who have had previous pelvic or femoral surgery. The key, though, is planning, planning, and planning. Uh, and that's where most of us who do hip replacements would spend our time before we go in so that we don't have any surprises. And, and 3D planning is only but one other tool in our armamentarium. So you need to be aware of the acetabular anatomy, look for the re residual dysplasia, and if there's any malalignments, as I showed in the, uh, in the case earlier. Look at the proximal femoral anatomy, look at the varus, vulgus, rotational malalignment, axis, antiversion, uh, and in my practice, intramedullary callus a lot of the times, and canal diameter. And this is one of, one of the problems which happens. So this patient obviously had a, a, a large intramedullary callus, the entry point was not really in the correct alignment. Uh, the canal was narrow, and the surgeon discovered to the disadvantage that that femoral head is now malpositioned. The patient had lengthening and instability and would re require revision. So the solution that we came up with in, in Stanmore has been to have uh, CAD CAM hips, and, and we've reported uh, a very good 97% survival at the medium term. Majority of those patients obviously presented with avascular necrosis, hip dysplasia, and, and similar problems as we discussed. So when I was presented with a patient like this, who's 30 years of age, female, has had 26 previous procedures, and none of the abductors were functioning, we thought we'll plan this. So, so we, I thought, well, I was told this is going to be a, a well-fitting prosthesis, and I discovered to my disadvantage it wasn't. So, so we ended up doing a, 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 an osteotomy, subtrochanteric osteotomy, uh, and she, she continues to do well. She's three and a half years down the line, uh, has very little problems, and is managing. This other patient, on the other hand, hip dysplasia. So we put in the custom implant, and within three years, she fractured because the osteotomy did not heal. So this patient with osteogenesis imperfecta needed a, a whole femoral, uh, femoral canal stem, uh, which was not possible to design with the technology that we had available. So we ended up using a smaller stem and uh, a fascia dual telescopic nail. So like most of us who deal with cases like this, we have a collection of implants which were designed, custom built, but never used. So that's uh, hundreds of thousand pounds worth of implants sitting there gathering dust. And I'm sure your managers, if they find out, they wouldn't be happy with that. So 2D design custom processes work well in a large number of cases. But if the anatomy is too abnormal, or if you're going to have to do intraoperative procedures to fit that implant in, you haven't really achieved much as, as, as compared to off-the-shelf implants. And you have to ask your question, are they really custom built? as we've been talking this morning and early this afternoon, that the proximal femoral anatomy is much more complex than what you see on two-dimensional x-rays. 
So when I had a patient like this who's 19 years of age, had septic arthritis, and has had about seven or eight previous procedures, there's a dysplastic acetabulum, non-existent femoral neck, and a deformity of the proximal femur. We thought we'll try the symbios. And uh, as you will agree, that there's no medullary canal at the proximal femur, very little bit of medullary canal in the subtrochanteric region. There is uh, antiversion, we'll, uh, I think it was about 25 degrees, and there's shortening of about five centimeters. So th th that's, the, that's the plans we came up with. Uh, and we decided that uh, we should be able to correct most of these deformities in one go. Obviously, you can see that the medullary canal is non-existent, so you're going to have to ream it, and there'll be a very high contact. But he's done very well. Um, again, about three years down the line, uh, he's playing football, uh, does most things he wants to, uh, so watch this space. And we know from Alexis' data and from Professor Serielli's data that we can reproduce our antiversion, femoral canal alignment, and acetabular alignment in more than 90% of the patients. So we hope that they'll perform well in the long term as well. So in conclusion, total hip replacement after previous osteotomies is, is a challenging procedure, but nevertheless doable. But you, you must be prepared to, uh, you must plan and be prepared to improvise, because sometimes your best laid plans may not work very well. 3D planning, I believe, is more accurate than two-dimensional planning, and it gives you a reproducible outcome. Uh, Obviously, I haven't had as much experience as Alexis and Professor Sarielli did, but I suspect this will offer us a, a one of the solutions, one of the answers to the questions that we all had and we discussed earlier on today. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ty. Any, uh, any questions from the floor? No. Thank you. Justin, are you here? Great. I think we're all done. Well, I would like to uh, thank our speakers. I think this was a very, very interesting day. And very. Uh, there's a lot to do in uh, surgery uh, for the future. I think uh, we'll agree that, uh, you know, discovering the hip in 3D is a, is a very interesting uh, a project for the future. Uh, we are working, obviously, with you to try to solve this problem. Some of them, and particularly the anterior-posterior balance, we, we have this issue at Symbios as well. I'm not saying that you know, we have the solution for this. Uh, it would be very pretentious. But, but uh, I think uh, every day we're working. We are now building approximately uh, uh, 1,500 uh, custom prosthesis per year. So it's quite quite a lot, it's growing, and uh, our clinical results uh, you know, help us to, uh, to continue to do this. So uh, thank you again for our speakers. Thank you to the uh, UK team for this uh, great meeting, and I hope uh, to see you soon. Thank you very much, bye-bye. <laughs>